Welcome everybody to this video about the exposure notification, which is this initiative by Apple and Google that has been in the news a lot. And it seems to me that people are still sometimes getting a little bit confused what it is and what it isn't. I think it's always important to also think about what things are not doing or covering. So I want to give you a very brief introduction today, what this is, what it does, what it doesn't do and how it fit into the larger picture. So when you look at what this API is all about, it's about how can we manage the world better in which people are having coronavirus. And the general idea is something that I presented in my last video that talked about how this picture really looks like when you look at it from a technical but also kind of principled point of view, right? So in the end, what happens is you have a little bit of communications happening. So you have a person running around with a phone and then there is an app on the phone that somehow allows that person to figure out whether they have been exposed in some shape or form. And then that app talks to a server so that, for example, when somebody got exposed, then they can report that they have been exposed and others can be notified. So that's the general idea. And if you want to have a little bit more details there, um, please watch my last video, which was about this general idea. Now, when we look at what Apple and Google are doing, they are really just doing things on the device, which is not surprising because that's what they create, that's what they ship, that's what they control, other devices. So in the end, when you look at what this Apple and Google initiative really is about, it's about having devices out there and using the devices to do proximity tracing. Which device has been in proximity to another one? And then when you track that over time, you can notify people. And in order to do that, what this specification does is really not more than two things. It talks about how the Bluetooth communications work. That's this little arrow number one there between all the other devices and let's say my device. So how is the Bluetooth signal really exchanged between those devices? And then there's another API, which is API number two in this figure, which is how, do an, how does an app that runs on a phone interact with the phone itself and what kind of access does the app have to the data that the phone is observing and collecting. And when we look at this in a little bit more detail, then what you can see is for this Bluetooth API, what happens is every day your phone in this model creates a new temporary key, meaning that basically every day you get a new identity which makes it easier for you to remain anonymous, which is one of the goals of privacy preserving proximity tracing. From these temporary keys that are generated once per day, every 15 minutes, another key is generated, which is called a rolling proximity identifier. And that rolling proximity identifier changes every 15 minutes. So people can actually only track you if they want to for 15 minutes. So you're not trackable as an individual over time. And that's important for privacy reasons. And then what's also in this Bluetooth API is minimal metadata that talks about which version of this whole API of this protocol is being used and what is the signal strength that somebody is using to send out the Bluetooth signal, because that can be used by the phone to better estimate how far was that other device away. So it's something where you can make a better estimate for, in the end, calculating risk. All of this goes into a data structure. We don't have to look at that at all. Uh, that's, that's part of the spec, for example, that talks about how this Bluetooth data is really structured. So this is the data that gets exchanged between phones via uh, Bluetooth so that a phone can figure out that another phone has been in proximity. So that's one of the two APIs that is defined in this exposure notification standard. The other one is the mobile device API. So that is the API that actually runs on the device itself and connects the app with 
the underlying operating system. So these, these APIs exist in two flavors. There's one for iOS, for iPhones, and then there's one for Android, for Samsung and many other phones that run Android. So by covering iOS and Android, you actually cover a, a good share of phones on the planet. The nice thing about having those two covered is that for one, developers can develop the same kind of app for both types of devices because the devices can do the same thing because they implement the same specification, the same API. And the other nice thing is that because we have both devices now supported, Bluetooth and um, Bluetooth APIs also work across devices, meaning that if I meet somebody who has an Android phone and I have an iPhone, that still works, which of course is great because if it didn't, it would be bad because I could only measure my risk in terms of how many other iPhone users did I meet who were maybe infected. So, so that's a really good thing that these two worlds are coming together. And the API itself is really simple. So what an app can do, if you install such an app on your phone, what can it actually do? It doesn't really have that many things it can do. It can start or stop the exposure notification service. In which case, if you start it, your phone will ask you, or do you really want to do it? Because now I'm starting to send out Bluetooth signals and I'm starting to listen for Bluetooth signals. Do you really want to do this? And when you say yes, then this service will start running on your phone and the app can only start it and stop it. The phone itself is what actually does the whole Bluetooth work for you. There are methods for reporting infected users, meaning that my app will at regular intervals call a server and the server will give me data that says here is um, the set of keys belonging to people who have been infected. And then what my app will do after retrieving those keys from the server, it will actually pass these keys into the operating system. And then the operating system determines whether I have been um, have been exposed to one of the keys that I have received or not. So it's not the app doing this. The app only forwards the data from the server to the operating system. And then if I have been exposed, then my phone will show a notification and say, based on the last data that we have received, you may be infected, so you should get tested or you should quarantine yourself or whatever it is that is appropriate. And then there's also a method for how to report infection, meaning that on my phone and my app, I can say I tested positive. And in many cases, there will be some kind of authorization mechanisms where either it's just the phone asking me, do you really want to trigger this? Or maybe only doctors can actually trigger this and they have to enter some code that depends on the app, how it secures triggering this specific kind of action. But if that action is triggered, what happens is the phone then will release all the keys that I have used in the last 14 days. And then these keys are sent to the server. Because if I self-report as infected, my identity, not my identity at the person level, but my identity at the exposure notification level needs to be forwarded to the server so that the server can then make that available to other users of the system and they can say, oh, I saw that key and I should alert my user because they were um, exposed. And then that's all that happens. So in summary, what I really wanted to highlight in this very short video is that what exposure notification is, is it's a method for privacy preserving Bluetooth by using Specific, specific methods around um, generating keys and changing keys and, and so forth. It is a specification that has APIs in it for Bluetooth and for apps that run on phones. So it allows me to build an API. And it also has a model built in for exposure data because the phone itself determines in the end whether I have been exposed or not. 
by doing some calculations around signal strength, how long did you observe um, this temporary key and so forth. So, so there's a model built into the machinery that determines whether I've been exposed or not. So what the Google and Apple model is not is it's not an app. So countries still need to program their own apps. Right? The app will run on the phone and the app will use the Apple and Google code that is part of the phone's operating system. So it's not a complete solution. That is really important to keep in mind. And what it also isn't is a central place where data is collected. So the data is really collected on the phone, right? It remains on the phone and it's only released when I say that I've been infected and then it's sent to the server so that it can be sent to other phones. So the idea there is really to exchange as little data as possible, once again, in the interest of privacy. So that's it. That's all that I wanted to talk about. So that's some really brief information about the Apple Google exposure notification specification. I am tracking this specification and I'm planning on producing a little bit more content around this because I think it's important that people learn more about how this works so that they feel more confident to actually use it. And if you're interested in more information, I have three things that I want to create videos around and please let me know which one you find most interesting. So one topic is more details around the Bluetooth communications. How does it really work to keep you private? How does the key exchange work and so forth? So, so that could be one topic. The second topic is how does the API on the device look like? So a little bit more detailed look at what the device actually provides in terms of services to the app. And the third video that I'm thinking about, which is not really exactly in the same space um, of the Apple Google thing, but it's very closely connected, is a comparison of the DP3T initiative and the um, PPPPT. So, so the decentralized and the decentralized and the centralized approaches that are currently um, being championed by different countries. So some countries favor the decentralized approach, other countries favor the centralized approach. If, you, if you're interested in a video comparing these two general approaches, let me know. Okay, so thanks very much for listening and please subscribe to this channel and you'll get more information around these things and many other API topics.